Hello and welcome to this video lecture on job analysis, which is considered to be the cornerstone of all human resource management activities. It might not be the most exciting topic in this course, but it is extremely important to the selection process. So let's get started. What exactly is job analysis? So job analysis is the purposeful and systematic process of gathering information on the important work-related aspects of a job. Each job within an organization must be understood in terms of its tasks, duties, and responsibilities before any of the many HR practices can be designed. Other HR practices, such as training programs, compensation, performance appraisals, recruitment, and of course, selection, obviously depend on the content of jobs within the organization. When you look at a job description, do you stop to think about how this job description was written? It is a result of carefully examining and documenting the components of an existing job within an organization. A job is a collection of activities or responsibilities assigned to an employee. The job can be described in terms of its work activities, tools and equipment, work context or working condition, conditions, and the requirements or the KSAOs. The reason that job analysis is important in human resource selection is that we must identify the tasks within a job that need to be performed successfully and then identify the KSAOs that are necessary to perform those tasks that lead to success so that we can hire the best person for the job. Let's move on. Job analysis data can be used in various ways within HR selection. The use of job analysis and selection increases the likelihood that the selection process will be job related which is required for legal compliance as well as for hiring highly qualified employees. First, job analysis data is useful for identifying employee specifications or KSAOs or WRCs, whatever it is you want to call them, that are necessary for success on a job. The KSAOs are the hiring requirements that we examine when considering job applicants for open positions. Second, job analysis data may be used to select or develop tests that assess important KSAOs identified for a job. These tests can be administered to job applicants and used to forecast, or in other words, predict which individuals will likely be successful on a job. Predictors in the selection process, such as structured interviews, cognitive ability tests, or personality tests, are used to measure the amount of the KSAOs the job applicants have so that we can then compare the job applicants and predict who will be our best hires. Third, job analysis data may be used to develop criteria or standards of performance that employees must meet in order to be considered successful on the job. Criteria and measures are used in performance appraisal process to ensure that employees are meeting acceptable performance and productivity levels. Also, these criteria are used in the process of validating selection predictors by determining the strength of the relationship between predictor scores, that is test scores on selection instruments, and criterion scores, that is a numeric score for job performance. In other words, scores on predictors used in the selection process should show a strong positive relationship with scores or ratings on subsequent on-the-job performance by employees. Our ultimate goal is to predict employees' job performance. Now, at this time, it's important to clarify what I mean when I use the term criteria or criterion and what I mean by predictor. Criterion is another word for dependent variable or outcome variable. In this course, the dependent variable, that is the criterion, is job performance. Predictor is another word for independent variable or antecedent variable. In this course, we will study a host of different predictors in the form of selection test scores. We will learn how to score intelligence, personality, interviews, and applications. These things are part and parcel of employee selection and cannot be developed without job analysis. 
You have to know what people do in the job and what individual KSAOs are necessary before you can pick the selection test. Not all selection tests are perfect for all jobs. Let's move on. This figure depicts the role of job analysis in the employee selection process. As you can see, the process begins with the use of the job analysis method to systematically gather information about the TDRs or task duties and responsibilities of a job. This information produces what is typically called the job description. At this point, you will notice that several inferential leaps must be made in order to further develop the selection process. It's fairly straightforward to develop the job description because tasks, duties, and responsibilities are relatively easy to observe or to describe. The more complicated part of job analysis is then inferring at inferential leap number one, inferring the characteristics of human applicants that are most likely to be associated with the ability to successfully perform the job. These human attributes are not readily observable and so the next step, or inferential leap number two, is to develop mechanisms for identifying or measuring these attributes in our job applicants. We use selection tools such as tests, interviews, and applications to obtain scores or ratings of each identified attribute for each job applicant. These scores and ratings represent the levels of the attributes that are hopefully associated with the actual level or presence of these characteristics within the person. Now, as you can see, making these inferential leaps can introduce quite a bit of uncertainty and possible error in our prediction of whom we should hire. Now, at the bottom of the figure, you will see two additional inferential leaps that must be made in the selection process. Inferential leap number three suggests that job analysis information can be further developed to identify acceptable performance levels of successful employees. In other words, it's not enough to just describe a job and its component. It's also necessary to specify how well each component should be performed. Employee performance measures are then used in inferential leap number four to validate the selection tools used in the hiring process. In sum, any time we are required to make an inferential leap, we are making one or more assumptions. As the saying goes, you know what happens when you assume. Okay, well, let's not go there, but hopefully you get the point that assumptions and inferences introduce more uncertainty and error into the selection process. But we simply must make these leaps. The use of job analysis and test validation will help us reduce errors as much as is possible. Let's move on. The process of job analysis is increasingly being seen as vital to successful hiring practices. First, organizations are recognizing more and more that they need current, accurate job data. Jobs change in response to changes in factors such as technology, competi uh, competition, consumer taste, and preferences. Job descriptions and specifications should be reviewed regularly and periodically to make sure that up-to-date up information on jobs is available. This is important because so many HR decisions are dependent on high-quality and current job analysis information. Now, a second reason that job analysis is more important than ever has to do with the federal guidelines and professional standards. Two documents in particular have elevated the importance of job analysis. One is the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, which was produced by the EEOC, or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, generally just referred to as the Uniform Guidelines, or sometimes even as just the Guidelines. Many recent court cases have given substantial weight to the Uniform gu Guidelines in their rulings, which means that organizations should pay special attention to the Guidelines when using job analysis and when validating their selection procedures. A second document is the Principles for the Validation and Use of Personnel Psychology Procedures, often just referred to as the Principles, 
which was produced by the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, of which yours truly is a longtime member. These principles emphasize the use of job analysis in demonstrating the job relatedness of selection processes. When in doubt, consult the uniform guidelines and the selection principles. A last reason that the importance of job analysis growing has to do with litigation involving discrimination in selection. In general, an organization has a better chance of defending its selection processes in a court of law against a charge of illegal discrimination if the organization can, can show that a thorough job analysis was conducted and if job analysis was then tied to validation efforts. The use of job analysis increases the odds that an organization will develop meaningful, non-discriminatory, job-related hiring procedures, which is actually required by law to avoid illegal discrimination. Let's move on. Here are some of the legal precedents that guide the use of job analysis. Job analysis is a critical component of developing a legally defensible hiring process. As with any aspect of human resource management, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act comes into play. As you recall under Title VII, it is illegal for an organization to refuse to select an individual or to discriminate against a person with respect to compensation, to terms, to conditions, or to privileges of employment because of their race, sex, color, religion, or national origin. Recently added to that list is sexual orientation. In order for an organization to defend itself against a charge of discrimination under Title VII, it must show that its selection process is job-related. The first of two landmark court cases regarding job analysis is Griggs v. Duke Power, which was a 1971 Supreme Court ruling having to do with the job relatedness, otherwise known as the validity, of a selection tool. This is often referred to as the high school diploma case. In this case, Duke Power required a high school diploma for higher level jobs within its organization. This job requirement resulted in adverse impact against black employees who wished to move up to higher level jobs. The court found that neither a high school diploma nor any intelligence associated with the diploma were shown to have a demonstrated relationship to job performance for higher level positions. In other words, the job requirement was not validated. Validation of a selection device involves an analysis of the job for which the device is used. Furthermore, the court ruled that selection standards must reflect a meaningful study of their relationship to job performance ability. It is noteworthy that job analysis was not technically mentioned in this case, but it is widely assumed that this case led to other issues of legality regarding job analysis. A second Supreme Court case relating to job analysis is the 1975 ruling under Albemarle Paper Company v. Moody. In this case, a group of black employees brought suit against the company, alleging, among other things, that its employment testing process was discriminatory. Although Albemarle showed that it had conducted validation studies of its employment test to some degree, the ruling stated that validation efforts were haphazard and inadequate. In particular, the Supreme Court supported the use of the EEOC Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, which requires job analysis as part of a validation study. In this case, job analysis was not used in validation efforts, but the court ruled that it was required. Let's move on. A large number of job analysis techniques are out there. Most methods rely on interviews, questionnaires, or a combination of the two when gathering job analysis information. Job analysis methods also typically differ in terms of a focus on either the nature of the work or the nature of the worker. 
Here's a list of four commonly used job analysis methods. The first method is a job analysis interview. In this method, job analysis data is collected from incumbent or supervisors by a trained analyst asking questions about the duties and responsibilities, the KSAOs required, equipment used, and working conditions for a job. The interviews are conducted to collect information on tasks that will then serve as a basis for developing a job analysis questionnaire. Task analysis questionnaires utilize survey methods to collect job information from respondents by asking them to rate the degree to which various job activities are present in their jobs or to rate the degree to which various KSAOs are required in their jobs. This is a more standardized method of gathering information than under the interview method. Such questionnaires are either tailored or prefabricated. Many times, tailored questionnaires are the result of the aforementioned job analysis uh, interviews, and they were much more specific to a certain job. On the other hand, many off-the-shelf prefabricated questionnaires have been developed to be used in job analyses of a large number of jobs that can sometimes be very different from each other. Noteworthy among the prefabricated questionnaires is Functional Job Analysis, or FJA, which was developed for the Department of Labor. This method was used to develop the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, which has served as the basis for the present ONET online. ONET online, say it again. It classifies jobs in terms of tasks associated with data, people, and things. It also identifies levels of worker attributes, such as required levels of mathematics and reasoning. I urge you to look at this ONET online. The critical incidence technique asks subject matter experts, or SMEs, sometimes just called SMEs, to develop examples of good and bad job behaviors for a particular job. The SMEs are usually job incumbents and their supervisors. They know the job. They are experts in the job. They are subject matter experts. These examples are then intended to demonstrate successful performance from unsuccessful performance. We'll take a little closer look at this later. Lastly, subject matter expert workshops or SME workshops are actually a combination of more than one method such as a task analysis inventory and an interview, where a large number of job incumbents, maybe 10 to 20, are gathered to provide job analysis information. Most research has shown that the use of multiple methods in job analysis provides superior information to the use of one method alone. This makes sense, as it is important to gather enough information about jobs from a variety of different angles to provide accurate data. Let's move on. As previously mentioned, the job analysis interview is just as it sounds. Job analysis information is gathered by one or more trained analysts by interviewing incumbents or supervisors familiar with the focal job. These interviews should be structured in order to gather all relevant information and also so that there is a standardized way to record and analyze the interview data. Here's an example of a structured job analysis interview schedule. As you can see, it is very thorough. The structured interview schedule includes questions about job tasks, required KSAOs, physical activities, environmental conditions, and so on. Information from the interviews is used to produce task statements that represent work activity on the job. Over time, task statements are refined and combined and ultimately reflected in the resulting job description, description and specification. Let's move on. This slide depicts a shortened example of a task analysis inventory for the job of personnel analyst. As you can see, the number of job task statements are listed in the column on the left. They are numbered vertically from 1 to 105. Respondents are asked to rate each task statement using a Likert-type response format, 
for both frequency and importance for a newly hired employee. Let's take a closer look at one of the statements and the response requirements for the job of personnel analyst. Job task number five states, write computer programs using SPSS in order to analyze personnel, absenteeism, and turnover data. Then, how frequently does the incumbent do that task? Let's say it's, I don't know, occasionally. So we give it a three. Then there's the issue of how important it is for a newly hired employee to have that skill or ability. Let's say that it is very important, so we give that a four, and we move on down the list. Once the data are gathered and compiled, the tasks that meet a specified threshold of criticality are retained. The threshold of criticality could be calculated in many different ways. It could be the product of the two numeric responses, uh, needing to be in excess of a uh, preordained specific level. It could be a predetermined threshold of, say, four on either of the two responses. It could be anything. And these are just a couple of examples of thresholds or cut scores that might be used. Let's move on. The purpose of the critical incidence technique is to generate a work-oriented list of observed good and poor critical performance behaviors of incumbents to be grouped into dimensions. Let me say that again. To generate a list of behaviors by incumbents to be grouped into dimensions. These critical incidents can be helpful in creating behavioral interview questions for selection purposes as well as providing information for performance evaluations. The critical incident characteristics include the following. First, the incident focuses on a specific, a single observable behavior that has been or could be exhibited on the job. Next, it briefly describes the context in which the behavior occurred. And last, it indicates the consequences of the behavior. So application of the critical incident technique includes the ability to generate a list of job-related behaviors on which to base inferences regarding worker specifications and to determine how to measure worker specifications that are consistent with what occurs on the job. Implementation of the technique includes the following steps. Selecting the method for critical incidents collection, selecting a panel of job experts, gathering critical incidents from incumbents and supervisors, and then rating and classifying critical incidents into job dimensions. Some of the advantages of using critical incidents includes the fact that the process creates a large amount of specific job-related behavioral, and not trait-based, but behavioral information about a job. This is useful in setting expectations for performance on the job. The process also identifies critical incidents that are important aspects of the job so that job holders can be made aware of their importance. Disadvantages of the critical incidents technique are several. First, incidents may not represent the full scope of the job. Also, analyst judgments affect the stability of the dimensions. That is, some analysts may consider some job aspects as more important than other analysts would consider them. Also, the developmental process is very labor-intensive. Lastly, the results are situation-specific, so they are not generalizable to other jobs or organizations. Thus, they must be generated anew each time that the process is undertaken. Let's move on. And now for a few words about the future of job analysis. I've stressed in this lecture just how important job analysis is to the organization. However, some experts are questioning whether job analysis will even be necessary in the future. First, revolutionary changes are redefining the nature of work. Changing technology and a global economy are requiring organizations to do more with less, to utilize teamwork, and to be more flexible and nimble. 
Therefore, the traditional job with a fixed, defined bundle of tasks is disappearing. Employees are asked to be flexible and to contribute wherever they are needed instead of just saying, hey, that's not my job. Also, a process-based view of work is emerging. Instead of what an employee is supposed to be doing on a job, the focus should perhaps be on refining the process that is followed in transforming inputs to outputs for customers. Lately, work analysis concepts are developing, but still lack some widespread agreement. This relates to the idea that perhaps we should move away from the concept of job to the concept of work instead. This idea is gaining steam, but by no means is it the consensus among HR professionals that we should abandon job analysis at this time. Do not despair. You are learning about job analysis because it is important. It's not going away anytime in the near future. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.